Hi, I'm Rain Plon from the University of Sydney, and I'll be working through sample problem C. Uh, as I've done with other examples, the first thing I like to do is to go through the first three tests. So as we can see here uh, in our un unsaturation tests, we can see that the solution turns colorless, which tells us that this is a positive result. And sample C must be containing a triple or a double bond, one of the two. So we'll bear that in mind as we come back to look at the other data. The oxidation test was negative in this case, so there's nothing that can be oxidized. And the carboxylic acid was also negative, so there's no carboxylic acid present. So that kind of rules out a lot of the oxygen bearing functional groups that we might expect to see. Not entirely, but most of. Now, as with before, I tend to skip IR and mass spec and come back to those later. They're kind of good for con confirming uh, a bit of the ideas that we get from the, particularly the NMR spectra. So I'm going to shift on down to the carbon and the proton NMR and work through these. Now for the carbon NMR, we can see here we've got five strong signals, five peaks. I'm just going to label these from left to right. This is very arbitrary. And the first thing I note about, notice about this, right, well, bear in mind we're looking for a, a double or triple bond, is we can see that peaks one and two are actually quite deshielded. And this lines up with what we would expect to see from a double bond or a triple bond. In both cases, uh, electron density is localized between the carbons rather than around the nuclei of the carbons. Therefore, the nuclei are deshielded. So one and two, to me, suggest that they are the carbons involved in that double or triple bond. Peaks three, four, and five, we can see are down in the alkane region, around between 10 to 40 ppm. But we can see that they're kind of staggered. Okay, so once again, to me, what this looks indicative of is a straight chain away from that double or triple bond, rather than maybe something branched. So we'll keep, we'll keep that in mind as we go, but that idea of three is going to be a little bit more deshielded because it's kind of close, four, a little bit further away, a little less deshielded, and five, the furthest away, will be the least amount of deshielded. Now we know from a carbon NMR, five peaks suggests five carbons, but say we had a symmetrical structure, it might actually be 10 carbons or 15. So I tend to start with the simplest ratio to begin with, and we'll come back to the mass spec later to think a bit more about that. Now in the proton enema, it looks like there are only five peaks on this uh, particular spectra. But if we look down here in the peak data table, we can see that there are actually six. And this is a little bit, can throw you off a little bit. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get it get to it, particularly the peak at five, I think is going to be the trickier one. So I'm going to label these. And I'm going to start by saying, well, there's one peak at about, what's that, near six, just shy of 5.81 according to the table. Let's say that there's actually two peaks at about five, matching up with the table, so B and C. And then we can see uh, the remaining three peaks are kind of down where we'd expect to see proton environments that are fairly well shielded. So maybe kind of around the alkyl, alkyl chain sort of environments. And let's just label these D, E, and F. Now, with this being said, we can now kind of think about, well, what is the shape or what's the multiplicity or the ratio of the, of the area um, within each of these peaks? And we might start with F and work our way from right to left. So F we can see here is telling us that we've got three protons in that environment. And immediately that makes me think terminal carbon. You know, so there's a terminal CH3. So it's likely going to be at the end of a chain. And that matches up with peak five in our carbon as well. E and D, we can see both of these have two and two protons in there, making me think that these are going to be carbons within the chain. They tend to have two protons within each. And if we think about the number of peaks, Okay, remembering our n plus 1 rule, um, a triplet, so where we see three peaks, suggests that there are two protons next to it. And if we think about a terminal proton environment and a CH2 next to it, that makes sense. Seeing six peaks in this uh, E peak that I've labeled, that to me suggests that we have 
three in the terminal, two in the next carbon next to it. So it's five protons around it. So we get six peaks. This is all lining up with our idea that there is a single chain afterwards. But then we get to these kind of um, funnier ones over here. And what we can see is that each of these apparently only has one proton present. And particularly B and C, that I've labeled on the actual NMR spectra itself, are very close to one another. So this to me suggests that these are very similar environments, but there is an important difference between them. And this is where our double bond really comes into play. So we're gonna, we're gonna come back to this one, but first of all, I wanna confirm how many carbons and hydrogens we think will actually be in this structure, because just as with the carbon, this is saying that if we sum up all of these ratios, there should be 10 hydrogens, but our mass spec may actually suggest that there are more than that, a multiple of 10. So let's scroll up to our mass spec. We'll start with our simplest ratio. We said that there were five carbons, which would suggest uh, 60, five times 12. We then also saw that there were 10 hydrogens going to our proton NMR, which would be 10, summing up to 70. And that matches the mass of our molecular iron. So we can see our molecular iron peak there at 70. Um, so this is telling us that we were right in our assumption that the simplest ratio was what it is. There are five carbons, there are 10 hydrogens. If we come to our IR then, I guess what we're really looking for here is just to kind of confirm what we've really established elsewhere. And there are a couple of peaks we can immediately point out. So up here at around our 3000, this is gonna be our C to H stretch. And that's a fairly common one for us to see. You'll see it in most of the other examples as well. Similarly, we can also see this peak at about 1450. That's gonna be our C to H uh, bend. Um, and once again, those two we tend to see in most of the examples you'll go through in this practice set. All of this region to the right is our fingerprint. So we can kind of ignore that. It's usually too messy to really pull out much from it unless you've got a really sensitive um, instrument and you're quite experienced in that area. Um, and I'm certainly not. But then we have this peak here. Now that peak uh, at about, I guess it's about 1600-ish, 1650-ish. Um, often you may see that and think immediately, is that a carbonyl, a carbon double bond oxygen? But we've already established by mass spec and also our proton and our carbon NMR that there's no oxygens present. So it can't be that. And in fact, if we look at a table of IR data, and I've got one up here on my screen that I can see, this is actually going to be our double bond carbon. So I should have also mentioned here as well that the presence of 10 hydrogens and five carbons tells me that it is a double bond and not a triple bond. Because if it was a triple bond, we'd be missing two more protons. We'd be down to eight protons instead. But this would be our carbon double bond carbon stretch. Okay, so we've now kind of got all of this together. And really the last puzzle then is to talk a little bit about why we see two peaks here for B and C that are almost identical to one another. So let's start by drawing out a proposed structure. So let's start with maybe our chain. We know that there are three carbons that are kind of at a chain. There's a terminal CH3 at the end of that. And then we have, and then we have two more carbons that will be our double bond. So let's go one, two, double bond here. Now as drawn, that I haven't drawn in the hydrogens here, but they're implicit in when we draw a line structure that has five carbons, 10 hydrogens, and we would call this <clears throat> pent one ene or one pentene, either one is fine. But I wanna talk just a little bit longer about labeling this now with our data from our two spectra. So in terms of our peaks for our uh, from our carbon, we can say confidently that this is five, four, and three. As we get close to that double bond, there'll be an increasing amount of deshielding, which is why we see the shift. When we get to the double bond itself, we then need to think, well, which of those two carbons is going to be more deshielded? And of the two, the carbon that is both in the double bond and bonded to another carbon 
would be the most de-shielded because some of its electrons are contributing to that sigma or that single bond, and therefore the nucleus is further de-shielded. So I would pose that this carbon is one, and that carbon is two, according to the carbon NMR. Now I'm going to have to change colors. I'll go to purple, right? Because again, we can easily label our proton NMRs that are down in the chain. So this would be F, this would be E, and this would be D. And of the remaining three, we've got A, which seems to be the most de-shielded, and then B and C overlapping a little less de-shielded. So I would suggest that A is probably the single proton coming off of carbon one. And now we're left with B and C being on the same carbon. And you might wonder, why is it saying there are two different signals? This is because of the property of a double bond. A double bond leads to the fact that you can't rotate that bond anymore. So you have a stereoisomer. So what we need to think here is we actually have two protons here that are locked into a particular position, meaning that their interaction with what's around them will be different. It's not a symmetrical double bond. So I'm going to change color again to a green here. If we imagine a dotted line cutting that, that double bond in half, the proton that is going to be um, at the bottom half of that green line right, is going to be one of those signals because opposing it on the other side of the double bond is a proton. The proton that is above the green line is actually going to be opposing a carbon-carbon single bond. It's a really subtle difference, but it does mean that you get two different signals, even though they're basically overlapping. It's maybe a little bit more than what this problem really wanted you to work out, but that's why it's there in case you're curious. Uh, with that, I'll leave it there. Thank you.